This is a true story about my life that began roughly four years ago when I turned 16. I have been weighing whether or not I should post because I'm a little afraid the person this story is about will somehow see it and know it is me writing about them. Nevertheless, here I am. The minute I turned 16 I knew I wanted a job. The first one I was able to get, and the one I would have for the next couple years, was a restaurant job. This wasn't fast food but it also wasn't a full service restaurant. It was somewhere in the middle. I was a cashier and very 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 shy. This is important to notice some things that I'll talk about later continually happened because of how I was too resistant in speaking up. I'd say about halfway through my first year at the restaurant was when Chris was first hired. My first impression of Chris was this extremely tall, extremely loud, charismatic teddy bear. This was also the impression he gave the rest of the staff and the impression that remained with them the entire time he worked there. I honestly don't fully remember the first time I met him. Again, I was very shy and just liked to do my job in peace. All I really recall is that my manager was talking with him and introduced me as one of the only high schoolers on the staff and someone she thought was funny. I remember him telling me he was going to find me later to tell him a few jokes but I don't remember anything after that. From the beginning, it just seemed like he was suddenly stuck to me. What I do remember first is the hugs. Chris was a big hugger. He loved to hug every girl on the staff when he first arrived and when he was about to leave. I would feel very uncomfortable by this because not only did I hate being touched by a man I did not know, but he was also a man that was nearing 30 years old. Whenever he would come over to me, I would always find something to busy myself with in a corner so he wouldn't slash couldn't easily hug me. When he did end up catching me off guard and getting me into a hug, he would really linger and rub my lower back. No one else around me seemed to care or seemed uncomfortable by the constant hugs and this was a large factor in me feeling like I was overreacting. There was time I went in on my day off to put a request off in the office. I talked with one of my managers in the front for a few minutes when suddenly she heard someone talking over the headset to her. She looked at me, smiled and said, Chris sees you and wants you to wait until he's finished in the back so he can give you a hug. I couldn't control my grimace and told her I was out of there. She just laughed and I heard say over the headset I was running away as I walked out the door. For the next couple weeks, he didn't speak to me but I felt him stare all the time. It was a nice break from the hug attempts, but eventually he got over it and continued like before. Another particular hug I remember is when we were both alone in the back. I walked back there to get something and Chris was the only other person there. Usually the dishwashers or the manager or another server was there too. It made me almost stumble a step and I briefly hesitated. He always made me nervous to talk to others around and now we were alone and I knew he would start some sort of conversation. He saw me stumble and laughed and told me to come in. The entire conversation is a blur but I remember him asking me how I was feeling that day. I responded with some sort of dumb joke like, oh, you know, good, just dead inside. I thought he would laugh and we would move on. Instead he pouted his face, ah, and went in for the hug. I maneuvered it as best as I could into a side hug and patted his back. As I did, I felt his other hand press against my lower stomach and slowly rub it in a circle. He leaned down into my ear and whispered, it's okay, Chris will make it all better. I remember going white in the face, fake laughing, and backing right out of there. The entire exchange took less than 15 seconds but it destroyed my mood for the rest of my shift. And although this was definitely the worst interaction I've had with him so far, I still did not say a thing to anyone. The next thing I remember is the singing. Chris was I believe around 28 and a college dropout. His dream was to be a famous singer. He sang to customers, he sang in the back kitchen and dish room, and he most definitely sang to me. He made up songs about his high school girl and would walk back and forth by my station and sing what seemed like at an insane volume. I would cringe into my register and try to talk over his voice to the customers. I think the songs were really when I understood that although he was very touchy with everyone, he seemed especially interested in me. Every time we worked a shift together or saw each other. I say this as he was always in the restaurant even when he wasn't working. Seriously every day it was like he lived there. He would ask me to come over to his apartment after work. He would talk about how he wanted to show me some new thing he put in or bought or how he was going to throw a game night with the rest of the staff. He would seem upset when I said I couldn't because of school in the morning or because my mom wouldn't want me to as the rest of the staff was mostly college students. There was one time in particular I remember when I went to IHOP with the rest of the staff after a shift because it was the first time I ever worked up the courage and felt comfortable enough to hang out with them outside of work. 
Chris was there but I barely spoke with him and sat on the other side of the table. However, when I got up to go to the bathroom and then walked out after, Chris was waiting for me. I think he had pretended to need to go to the bathroom also but had just waited until I walked out. It was nearing when we were leaving and he grabbed my arm and asked if I would want to ride with him back to the restaurant where the rest of our cars were, most of us carpooled, instead of who I came with. I brushed quickly past him and jokingly said I thought my co-worker I rode with might be offended by that and ran back to our table before he said anything else. Although all of these things made me uncomfortable, I didn't truly feel a bit of fear until the movie night. This happened later into my time at the restaurant and I had made a couple friends there. Two girls that were around my age and I had become fairly close at this point and decided that after their shifts on Friday night, I would come pick them up and we would go see a movie at the mall close by. We laughed and talked and had a really good time. I remember really enjoying the movie all the way through to the end. However, when it ended and we all filed out, one of them looked briefly behind her and then stopped in her tracks. We both whipped our heads around immediately when she called out a confused Chris. It was then when I saw him kind of embarrassed and half hiding behind the staircase. He walked over, laughed, and then said, wow, this is so crazy. We then told him to wait a minute while we had to go to the bathroom. After rushing in, we all looked at each other with the widest eyes. I just started stumbling with my words and then they filled me in. They said he had been there during their shift earlier and overheard them talking about how I was going to pick them up for a movie. He asked which movie and they told him. They said he didn't ask anything else so either they were lying, but it really would not take a genius to figure out the location, the nearest one to the restaurant, and time, the one after their shifts ended, if he knew which movie. Although I could tell it had also weirded them out a bit. I was by far the most uncomfortable and they tried to calm me down by saying, oh, you know he has a little crush on you. He probably just knew you were gonna be there and wanted to come. This did not calm me down. They ended up deciding to go to McDonald's together afterwards and I faked that I wasn't feeling good and just had him take them while I went home. I'm sure I didn't fool anyone. I remember seeing his car everywhere I went although I knew he lived in the next town over. It was a car I remember well and whenever I had a shift. I would always check the parking lot for it to prepare myself. Although I don't want to say exactly how, it was definitely identifiable. I saw it rushing past me at the mall. I saw it outside of my local grocery store. And I even saw it briefly leaving my neighborhood. Every time I felt a rush of anxiety but again, I never said a thing. To anyone. One of the final things that happened when he still worked there was at my high school graduation. As I said before. I was one of the only high school students out of a staff of about 40, and definitely the only high schooler at my specific high school. I was close to a select few at my work, but not close enough that I thought anyone should come or be invited to my graduation, especially because it was an hour away and that's a lot to ask someone. The only people that knew where and when it was were friends graduating with me and my family. The afternoon went on and I had a great time. After the ceremony was over. Everyone was to leave the building and find their friends and family outside in the parking lot. We were arranged by last name so I had to wander a bit while calling my mom in order for us to find each other. It was then that I saw Chris. He was leaning against the side of the building and looking around intensely. Although he could have possibly been there for someone else, I knew in my heart he was looking for me. I quickly walked back into the crowd and told my mom to meet me in the complete opposite direction. We eventually found each other, took a few pictures and then I begged them to leave. I remember them being a bit surprised, but I chalked it up to me being tired from waking up early that morning. When I had a shift later that week, Chris came up to me and told me he had something to say. He revealed that he found out online when and where my graduation was and planned to surprise me. He said he was sad that he never found me but wanted to give me something. He handed me an envelope with a card inside and told me to open it later. I wish I could tell you all what it says, but I never opened it. I put it in my car and I either threw it out or it was just lost. Kind of a boring ending, but Chris continued to talk to me and I saw his car around a few more times, but nothing else happened like that. He was fired for no showing a couple times and I eventually moved out of state for college. I never saw him again and am so grateful for that. There were many more little things that he did throughout the years we both worked there, but then this story would be insanely long and I can't even begin to remember them all anyway. I think I didn't ever say anything for a couple reasons. First, of course, I was that shy and naive girl who thought I was overreacting especially because no one seemed to think how he acted was weird. In fact, they all really liked him and thought he was cool. And second, 
he didn't really completely behave like a stalker in a movie personality wise. He was very direct in wanting my attention or wanting to be near me and didn't hide that in front of my other co-workers. He came over when we called him out at the movies and he was honest in going to my graduation after the fact. Obviously I see everything crystal clear now, but it's almost as if I didn't say anything because I really didn't want to believe what was happening to me. Long time lurker on this channel, the recent events regarding the offending party in this story has made me reflect a great deal on what happened to me and my family. Around the time I turned 18, I was dating a girl named Allison who had a history of getting around, if you catch my drift. Unfortunately, I didn't find out about the true extent of her sordid history until after she left me for an up-and-coming male stripper in a larger city 100 miles north of our city. At the time I was dating Allison, I was actively playing guitar in a rock band in town with guys who were a year or two years older than me. Around the time that everything started going south with Allison, I was still living at home and beginning my first semester of college. Typical weekends involved our band playing at one of the various outdoor venues before Friday night football in town. Afterwards, Allison, my band members, and their significant others would typically go to IHOP or Denny's after the football game and plan for our next show. This particular weekend in question, tension between Allison and I was particularly strong as I had learned that she previously dated a guy I knew from high school named Ronald that was clearly mentally unstable. In one of the most amusing ways I could possibly find out about one of Allison's many ex-boyfriends, I made the mistake of talking to Allison's 88-year-old grandmother, who was in the mid-stages of senility. While Allison's grandmother never cared for me, she made it clear on this occasion that she fucking hated my family because you're all a bunch of spineless French blood-sucking lawyers who are trying to kill our town, and that Ronald was a strong, virile German boy that was perfect for Allison. Yes, those are the exact words she spoke. Allison's grandmother also let it be known that Ronald was frequently calling Allison and leaving flowers at her house at least once a week. For the record, I'm French, my family is full of lawyers, Ronald is German, Allison was very British to the point of a latent accent that remained after living over 10 years in the southern United States, and Allison's grandmother was mean-spirited and borderline batshit insane. As I had no idea Allison dated Ronald in the past, I let her know I was not pleased about her lack of candor in this matter, and that I worried for her safety because Ronald was a very unstable individual. In high school, Ronald was a year behind me and had a reputation for routinely making death threats to other students and often attempting to back up his threats by bringing knives to school almost on a daily basis. Likely, the only reason that one of my friends managed to escape Ronald's unstable wrath was the fact that we had metal detectors at every entrance to the school and Ronald never seemed to realize that the detectors, while old and slightly outdated, still managed to consistently alert on knives. Ronald had been in and out of a juvenile delinquency facility an inpatient mental health facility, and our school district's most severe form of in-school suspension each year he was in high school. Petty theft, burglary, an arson charge that was later dropped, and operating as a small-time meth and weed dealer were among the different activities he engaged in during high school. However, the most eventful incident that cemented his reputation occurred during my senior year when Ronald felt it necessary to attempt to slash a guy's tires with a katana sword during the middle of the night for cheating him out of a couple magic the gathering cards. Now, Ronald's family was equally as colorful as he was. His father was in the state prison system for at least 20 years for engaging in organized criminal activity, large-scale drug dealing in our state. His mother was a heroin addict who was in and out of treatment facilities in the criminal justice system for petty theft, and his older, college-age sister ironically dated my older brother and was fairly sane. As Ronald's parents were next to non-existent, Ronald's hyper-religious aunt also lived in their home. It's also worth noting that Ronald and his aunt were both extreme anime and Japanese culture fans, and had amassed a staggering amount of knives, broadswords, katanas, and throwing stars. Ronald's home was literally one block away down the hill from my home. Like much of the urban planning in the southern United States, a $500,000 home can be located within a block or so of sprawling apartment complexes or subdivisions full of dilapidated rental houses. In our case, Ronald's neighborhood was full of the types of individuals that he routinely sold meth and weed to before one of his buyers snitched on him for shorting them the requisite amount of product. Lesson learned, even drug dealers cut corners during an economic recession. With all of that information out of the way, it's worth noting that Ronald never fully accepted the fact that Allison was not interested in dating him long term. 
as a result of this inconvenient misunderstanding, he routinely showed up around her home while she was out with me. To make matters worse, the batshit insane grandmother kept feeding his delusions that they were still a couple. Allison's parents were both actively engaged in running a family construction business, so they were rarely, if ever home. In fact, in a total of a year and a half of dating, I probably spoke to her parents less than two hours in total. Now, being 18 years old at the time, I didn't think as clearly as I do now at 25. So, what did I do? I proceeded to bitch and moan to my band members about Allison's omissions and the fact that she dated Ronald. My bass player, a music major two years older than me, never let it be known that he was hiding a substance abuse problem and routinely bought weed from Ronald and or his aunt. So, within two days of complaining to my band, I began receiving text messages from Ronald saying that he had a God-ordained claim to Allison, and if I didn't fuck off, he was divinely authorized to kill me. Once again, being 18, I didn't react as appropriately as I should have. Numerous obscenity-laden text messages were exchanged, numerous hate-filled glances were exchanged, and numerous birds were flipped as we passed each other's respective homes. A little over a week after this Cold War began, I told Allison that my parents had enough of Ronald's harassment and were going to let the cops know about his death threats. I knew I should have seen it coming, but of course, Allison told Ronald. However, I began to have this gut feeling that Ronald was casing my house. I began waking up numerous times at night, checking all the locks in the house, looking out my window, and trying to fall back asleep. Two or three times that week, I saw the shadow of a person standing in our driveway. Pride kept me from honestly believing that Ronald was casing my house and or stalking me. Later in the week, my dad let me know that Ronald had come by his office after school numerous times that week, asking odd questions about me and my work schedule there. I routinely worked for my dad, but took time off that week to study for midterms. My dad said he was vague in his answers and had to escort him out of the office because Ronald decided that he would sit in my dad's waiting room two days in a row until I showed up for work. That Friday, my 15-year-old sister, Caroline, reported that Ronald had approached her and her friends after school. From what Caroline's friends told my parents, Ronald tried to hit on Caroline in some sick attempt to get her to tell him exactly where I was at that exact moment because he had a message to deliver. Needless to say, my parents began the process of seeking a restraining order against Ronald for both me and my sister. However, since it was Friday, nothing would get done with the courts until Monday at the earliest. That evening, my band played another outdoor venue before a football game. Ronald was in the crowd, blankly staring at me for what felt like the entire time we were playing. As soon as we were done with our set, I found Allison and made a beeline for my car. As I started my car, I looked to my left and saw Ronald in the passenger seat of a white car parked next to me, once again blankly staring at me. I quickly got out of the parking lot, only to look behind me and see the white car following me. I called my dad and he advised me to go immediately to the police station and he would meet me there. The entire time Allison barely said anything. As I entered the police station parking lot, the white car carrying Ronald slowly passed by. My dad showed up minutes later and he made a report and asked that the police conduct an extra patrol around our home, since Ronald lived only a block away. Afterwards, I took Allison home and drove home immediately. Two or three blocks away from my house, I saw the white car again. Not wanting to be the victim of a drive-by or get potentially jumped in my own driveway, I kept driving. I drove in and out of the adjacent subdivisions that led to the interstate. While I was doing this, I called my dad and let him know what was going on. My dad told me to try to lose them on the highway and keep driving to my uncle's house, who lived about 25 miles south of our house. After weaving in and out of the streets, I finally made it to the interstate. Probably going faster than I should have. I lost sight of the white car and made it to my uncle's house. Around 11 p.m., my dad showed up at my uncle's house with one of his friends, who was a local county sheriff's deputy. My dad rode with me back to the house as the deputy followed behind us. Nothing out of the ordinary happened on the way back. After getting back home, my dad's friend said he would stop by Ronald's house and let him know that he was criminally trespassed from coming near our home and made it clear that the sheriff's office and the local police were investigating the matter as a felony stalking case. Honestly, at this point, I figured Ronald would realize that Allison wasn't worth the effort of going back to jail. I was wrong. Three hours later, around 2 a.m., I received a frantic call from Allison. 
she essentially told me that I should probably call the cops because Ronald had fucking flipped. Not seconds after hanging up the phone, my bass player texted me that I should get myself, my sister, and my parents out of the house because that crazy bitch is coming for blood. At this point, I was fed up with the entire situation, but I couldn't deny that I was scared shitless of Ronald based on his behavior the past week. I woke up my dad and told him that Ronald was likely coming to pay me a visit. My dad, a rather irritable tax attorney and a former marine sharpshooter who served in the first Gulf War, got up, got dressed, went to his gun cabinet, and proceeded to pull out two pistols and one of his sentimental AR-15s. Within 10 minutes of the barrage of calls and text messages from everyone telling me to run for the border, my dad and I were staring out our second story window with a night vision monocular looking for Ronald. Ronald finally showed himself after around another 10 minutes. From looking through the monocular, my dad could clearly see that Ronald was standing in the middle of our street carrying a rather large sword. Meanwhile, my sister Caroline was in hysterics, while my mother waited on my dad's word to call the police if Ronald tried to vandalize and or break into the house. As my dad said, Ronald technically wasn't violating the criminal trespass warning since he was just standing in the street. However, seeing my sister in this type of distress made something in me snap. I recall calmly telling my dad I was going downstairs and would try to go talk him down. Stupid idea, my dad reluctantly agreed and followed closely behind me as I went to our front door, opened the door, and took one tiny step out on our porch. Behind me, my dad kept saying that if he drew his sword or did anything remotely antagonistic, I was to shut the door immediately. At first, I tried to politely engage Ronald and let him know that Allison was no longer dating him and he was misinformed by her grandmother. I quickly realized that Ronald was under the influence of drugs or in the middle of a psychotic episode. After I would speak, he would just blankly stare at me, wide-eyed, and say, the Lord God commands that I take what is mine. I didn't realize it at the time, but my mother had already called the police. I tried a few more times to let him know he was not welcome on our property and that we'd be forced to call the police if he took a step on our lawn. I told him that I didn't want to fight with him, and that it would be best if we just dropped everything. Again, more of the God is commanding me to end your script from him. Finally, I could tell something shifted in Ronald. His eyes and face tightened, as if he was concentrating intently on something. At this point, he started walking in a semi-brisk pace towards our door. Realizing that I would likely get hacked up, I hauled ass in the house, shut the door, and bolted our three locks. My dad then ran to our other two doors and ensured they were both locked. My mother looked out our dining room window and said that she couldn't see him. Pissed at being a prisoner in his own home, my dad decided to look through the peephole on our front door. In all the years I've been around my dad, I've rarely seen him scared. When he looked through the peephole, he jumped back, screaming, son of a bitch. Apparently, Ronald was standing less than two feet away from the door, holding the large sword in the air, waiting to hack my ass into pieces if I opened the door again. Needless to say, the police showed up minutes afterward. Point four cars in fact. Ronald was tossed up multiple times. A limited edition World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich King 47-inch broadsword was confiscated and Ronald was again committed to an inpatient mental facility. Charges were filed but were later dropped because he was found to lack the mental capacity to know the wrongfulness of his actions. Two months later, Allison left me for the aspiring male stripper because she couldn't deal with the drama in our town and needed to be with someone who had career goals. Six months after the incident, Ronald was deemed, treated, and was released back on the streets. He moved from the house down the street into an apartment complex on the other side of town around that time. I stayed in town after finishing a bachelor's degree in law school so I've seen Ronald around numerous times. I've gone significantly out of my way numerous times to avoid him. To this day, I hate knives and swords. I get nervous as hell being around them. My dad says it's the PTSD from the entire ordeal. He's probably right. Most recently, I unfortunately found out that Ronald had married one of Allison's friends, had a child, and was arrested less than two weeks ago for the murder of his wife. Ironically, I went to law school with the court-appointed attorney representing Ronald. Ronald's apparently looking at death row or life, absent a successful insanity plea. Finding out this unsettling series of events prompted me to write this post.